The ZV-E10 has been out for two and a half years now and it was often crowned as the content creator camera. It got a lot of attention when it was first released and it still does even years after. But what about 2024? Is this small vlogging camera still worth it today or was it all a hype? What about the alternatives or perhaps even the updated version that has been rumored? Let's talk about it. I bought my ZV-E10 almost a year ago to serve as a B camera for my Sony A7 Mark III or as a C camera when I'm using a Sony A7S III. I've been using it primarily to film myself while I'm using that main camera or as a behind the scenes camera. So I mostly use it to shoot video, but we'll also talk about the photo capabilities of this camera a little later on. First, let's talk about the video specs of the ZV-E10. With its 24.2 megapixel APS-C CMOS sensor, it can record 4K video at up to 30 frames per second and Full HD at 120 frames per second. So it delivers great image quality and you can use it to shoot some nice slow motion footage. This little camera also features Sony's excellent autofocus system with 425 face detection points. It offers excellent face and eye autofocus, so when you're filming yourself or other people, the autofocus will lock onto the face or the eyes and it will stay on, even if you're walking around in the frame or even in low light situations. This was one of the reasons that convinced me on the ZV-E10 and I believe it's vital for anyone self-filming. The ZV-E10's autofocus system also has touch tracking. That means you can tap on your subject on the screen and the camera will track it and stay locked onto that subject. Even when stepping in and out of frame, it will catch focus quite quickly. Another autofocus feature that is kind of unique to this camera is the product showcase mode. It allows you to quickly switch from eye autofocus to an object that is close by. This is great if you, for example, want to do product reviews or anything like that, and you don't want to have to change around the autofocus settings too much. You just press this button and Bob's your uncle. Now there's one more interesting focus feature on this camera, and I'm not actually sure if it's a good or a bad one, but I'll show you in a little bit. The ZV-E10 has 10 different picture profile options. Some of these profiles allow you to shoot a lower contrast image, which gives you more freedom when color grading. It's for example capable of shooting in S-Log2, S-Log3 and HLG. However, I wouldn't recommend shooting in S-Log3 because this camera does only do 8-bit recording. So in PP8 or S-Log3, the footage will quickly fall apart when grading. The S-Log2 picture profile on the other hand works great for color grading and it's what I've been using for years on my Sony A7 Mark III as well. I've already mentioned that the ZV-E10's autofocus performs well in low light situations situations, but also the overall low light performance of this camera is pretty decent. Especially if you pair it with a fast lens like an f1.8 or f1.4 lens and you choose the correct picture profile, you're able to get very decent low light footage with this camera. So even for people filming events or weddings or things like that, the ZV-E10 can be an option for you. And that brings me to one of the best things about this affordable little camera, and that is the fact that you can mount any Sony E-mount lens on the ZV-E10. And that gives you a ton of options for whatever you're going to be using this camera for. Anything from extreme wide angle lenses for vloggers to zoom lenses for a more run and gun setup. I mainly use the Tamron 17-70 to f2.8 on my ZV-E10 and this lens covers a large focal range and the f2.8 aperture provides a pretty decent low light performance and a nice out of focus background. Sure it's a pretty big lens for this tiny camera and it looks a little bit out of balance but it works works great for my needs. You can also buy the ZV-E10 with the 16 to 50 millimeter kit lens, which is fine if this is your first camera and you're still kind of experimenting. But to be honest, I think you can only really get the most out of this camera with a better lens. All right, now let's talk about the photo abilities of this camera and then we'll get into some of the bad stuff or you know, at least some of the things that you should really consider when buying the ZV-E10 in 2024. The ZV-E10's 24.2 megapixel sensor can capture still images at 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. 
And for most users, this is going to be more than enough, even if you need to crop in a little bit here and there. It can burst photos at up to 11 frames per second, which is pretty great for this little camera. And with a max ISO of 32,000 and a shutter speed as fast as 1 4,000th of a second, it will have you covered for most photography scenarios. The image quality is also perfectly fine. If we compare some of these shots with my a7 Mark III full frame camera, I think it's hard to see a strong difference. But there is one big downside to this camera for photographers, and that is the fact that the ZV-E10 doesn't have an electronic viewfinder or EVF. I know a lot of people shoot photos only using the screen and that's fine if that's your thing and this camera is great for taking photos here and there but not having an EVF to me is a big limitation when it comes to using this camera primarily for photos. So really if you're mainly looking for a photography camera I don't think that the ZV-E10 is the right choice and I'll share an interesting photo oriented alternative by the end of the video. Speaking of the LCD screen on the ZV-E10, let's talk about some of the bad stuff on this camera because it definitely has some flaws. And one of which is that back LCD screen. It's not very bright and it's also not very sharp. In bright daylight, it becomes hard to see clearly on the screen. And even though there is a sunny weather option, which increases the screen's brightness, using it will quickly drain your battery. This is also where an EVF would actually come in handy. Now, if you're using the ZV-E10 in let's say a YouTube studio environment or just indoors, the screen will do just fine. Just don't expect too much of it, I guess. Now, one of the biggest problems with the ZV-E10 is the rolling shutter issue when shooting video. When you move the camera quickly, especially when panning, your shots will look wobbly and jelly. Again, if you're a studio shooter or you just keep your camera on a tripod or you're mostly doing smooth camera movements with, for example, a gimbal, then you most likely won't have any issues here. The ZV-E10 is powered by older Sony MPFW50 batteries, which should last up to 80 minutes of video recording and 440 still photos. Now this pretty much means that if you're planning to shoot for longer periods of time or you have an entire day of shooting planned, you're gonna need quite a few extra batteries. Another common complaint is the old menu structure of the ZV-E10. Now, I personally haven't had a huge problem with it because it's the same as on my Sony a7 Mark III, but I definitely understand people's frustration with it. It's not an easy to navigate menu, and it takes some time to get through all the different menus if you want to change a few settings. It's a bit strange that Sony chose to use this menu system because they had just introduced their new and improved menu system before the release of the ZV-E10. One last negative I want to mention before we get back to some more good stuff is the digital stabilization of the ZV-E10. And this is actually a big one. So because this is more of a budget camera, it doesn't have IBIS or in-body image stabilization. And this IBIS, which you'll find in the more higher end Sony cameras, basically stabilizes the sensor to compensate for any movement. And that results in smoother videos or sharper photos at lower shutter speeds. Now, the ZV-E10 unfortunately doesn't have this, which is kind of weird for a camera that was marketed as a vlogging camera. Anyway, the camera does have digital stabilization and there are three ways to use it. One is the standard image stabilization, which only works if you have a lens width stabilization. So for example, the OSS on Sony lenses or the VC on Tamron lenses. The other option is active stabilization, which does a pretty good job of stabilizing the footage, but comes with a pretty hefty crop factor. The third option is actually turning stabilization or steady shot off and using Sony's stabilization software Catalyst Browse After. So the ZV-E10 stores gyroscopic data and you can then use that to stabilize the footage afterwards. And honestly, this will give you the best stabilization results, but it's a lot more post-processing work, which is just a bummer. Now there is actually a fix for this poor stabilization though. And this actually brings me back to some more positive things about this camera. The ZV-E10 is lightweight, it's small, and it's really easy to carry around with you if you're going on trips or as a second camera. And the fact that it is so small means that you don't need to buy a super expensive heavy gimbal to get some buttery smooth footage. You can pop the ZV-E10 on a small, lightweight, and budget-friendly gimbal, like this one from Feutech, for example. And that will get you much better quality smooth footage than the internal digital stabilization. A few other things that I really like on the ZV-E10 
10 is the fact that the screen is fully articulating, which is essential when filming yourself. Also, the thick red rectangle that appears around the screen to show that you are actually recording is a great feature, as well as the red tally light on the front showing that the camera is rolling. I also like that the ZV-E10 has a nice big movie record button on the top, which makes operation much quicker and easier. The USB-C tethering allows you to directly stream to a computer, which is great if you want to use this camera as a higher quality webcam when doing video calls. And lastly, the defocus button. When you press this button, the camera will cycle between the option clear, which essentially stops down the lens for more depth of field and a less blurry background. Or you can set it to defocus, which opens up the aperture all the way to isolate your subject from the background by making the background more blurry. Now, if you're someone who knows their way around a camera and you understand how aperture and depth of field works, this button might seem a little bit strange and even useless because you can get the same result simply by changing your settings. However, I understand why it's there and I understand that for some people who just want to pick up this camera and start filming, this is a nice feature to get quick results. You can also change the function of this button to whatever else you want in case the defocus function is not for you. Now, one of the biggest pros of the ZV-E10 is, in my opinion, actually its price. Even though I mentioned a few downsides to this camera, keep in mind that the ZV-E10 is currently only $699, and you'll even be able to find it secondhand for less than $500, which is a pretty incredible price for everything that this camera can do. Especially if we take a look at some of the alternatives. First, there is the Sony A6400. And this is actually almost the same camera as the ZV-E10. It's slightly more expensive, but for that you get weather sealing, a viewfinder, and an overall more photography focused camera body. However, the A6400 doesn't have a fully articulating screen. It doesn't have digital stabilization or eye autofocus for video. So it's obvious that this is going to be the better choice if photography is more important to you. But for anyone interested in shooting video, the ZV-E10 is definitely the better option for you. Next, the A6700, Sony's latest flagship APS-C camera. This one is double the price of the ZV-E10 and most definitely out performs the ZV-E10 in almost every way. The biggest differences are 10-bit color instead of 8-bit, the use of Z-type batteries, weather sealing, and better stabilization just to name a few. But I mean, it's double the price, so it kind of makes sense that it's better. Now there are some rumors that Sony will be releasing a new version of the ZV-E10 and these are just speculations because as far as I know Sony hasn't officially announced anything about this yet. But when the new version of the ZV-E10 comes it will most likely offer things we see on the A6700 or even the FX30. Things like a better sensor which will get you that 10-bit color and it will also have those better Z-type batteries and I'm guessing they'll probably update the autofocus as well. So is the ZV-E10 Mark II going to be better? Yes, obviously. But that being said, there is no confirmed release date for the second ZV-E10. So chances are you'll be waiting for another year or so for that one. And it will also be slightly more expensive than the current one. Okay, so should you still consider buying the ZV-E10? Is it still worth it today? Well, it really comes down to your needs and your budget. The important thing is to look at this camera from the right perspective. This is not a professional level filmmaking camera. And it definitely has its downsides, especially if you are looking at it from a more professional standpoint. But when looking at it from a content creator or a beginner videographer's viewpoint, this is a fantastic little camera for a very cheap price. Paired with a good lens and a few workarounds here and there, you'll be able to create beautiful looking shots with the ZV-E10. And in this price range, I really currently can't come up with anything that beats it. But if the downsides of the ZV-E10 are a deal breaker for you, then you should probably look at a more professionally oriented camera for which you'll definitely pay more. Anyway, that's pretty much my two cents on the Sony ZV-E10. I hope this video was helpful to anyone looking to get this camera. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.